Welcome to Quiet Adventures this evening. We're Richard and Ruth Daly, and we'll be sharing a retirement trip we took in 2019 to the national parks in Utah, along with the Grand Canyon and three of the many indigenous cultural sites in the southwest. I had never been west of the Mississippi and have had Bryce and Zion on my bucket list from pictures I've seen years ago. So, in 2018, we started to plan a trip. Once we put in Bryce and Zion, we realized that there were three other national parks in Utah and that they, in a way, made an arc across southern Utah. We could also see that the north rim of the Grand Canyon was reasonably close to Zion. From the Grand Canyon, we could visit several parks that would let us learn at least a little bit about the original peoples who inhabited the area. I was still working, so I let Richard do most of the planning and organizing. We were going to be mostly tent camping and chose to stay at the National Park campgrounds, but did mix in some motels and lodges. The National Park campgrounds fill up fast and have a six-month rolling registration window. Once we'd laid out a plan, I would be on the computer at recreation.gov early in the first day the registration was available for our time window. The lodges were a bit trickier, seemed to be full or nearly full a long way out. We did score a night at the Bryce Lodge and at the Zion Lodge. Don't forget about the senior pass. Boy did that save some money and make entry into the park so much easier. We were able to get ours before the price went up, but even now it's a great deal. Camping. We were able to pack everything inside the Forester and could still see out the back. We took the big tent, an REI Kingdom, and a Queen Air bed. Yes, we were glamping indeed. We ended up camping for 19 nights, never less than two nights at one place. We used motels on the way out and back, and at Mesa Verde, and at Canyon de Chez. The longest run in the tent was eight days at three campgrounds. We were able to get showers at the Needles Outpost campground and store just outside the Canyonlands. And boy, did that feel good. We also had seven days of tenting at Zion in the North Rim um, of the Grand Canyon. The North Rim campground does have coin showers and laundry available, thankfully. Quick overview. Going out, we chose to skip the pleasures of traveling around Chicago and went south to Indianapolis so that we take I-72 as US-36 west to pick up I-70 to Grand Junction, Colorado. Took an extra day in Hannibal, Missouri on our way out to explore a bit. With that, we took three nights, four days to Grand Junction, Colorado. Coming back, we took two nights, three days from Taos, New Mexico. Enough of that. Let's get started with the show. Okay, here we go. Honestly, the biggest surprise for me on this trip was the variety of plant life and the colors and textures that they provide. Here's a quick look at some of what we found. Plant life was some of the most amazing and surprising parts of our trip. We expected cactus and sand, rock and barren land. And in fact, we did find those things. We found rock and sand and cactus and barren land, but... We also found the juniper pinion woodlands, found mountain forests. We found absolutely amazing textures and colors. This link below is a great link to look up plant life in the area. This is what a pinion juniper woodland looks like with plenty of sage in the foreground. Some junipers were lush with berries. Locally, junipers are also known as cedars. The 
in the canyons, we'd find hanging gardens where water seeps through the rocks. These are some of the absolutely amazing textures we found. The seed pods of these yuccas are edible and were used by the indigenous peoples for food. This is a look at some of the biotic soil. Um, it's a living soil that holds, helps hold the sand in place and we were often warned not to move, step off the trails and disturb the soil. Blackbush is one of the key plants in the area. This park really knocked us out. It's an amazing place with really awesome scenery. The campground is fairly small and quite nice. This was our first stop in the desert and we took it a bit easy. We wanted to acclimate to the altitude and get an understanding of the environment a bit. The park is close to Moab. We called that Six Flags over Adrenaline. And so it was quite popular in our first introduction to National Park crowds. I started to read Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire while we were there. Appropriate to see how his complaints have come true. The drive-in is spectacular. The campground is in a spectacular location and is actually a fairly small campground. And if you have or desiring to camp there, you really need to get your reservations in at the beginning of that six month um, rolling time that's available for making your reservations. The amphitheater in the campground is probably one of the most gorgeous ones that we've come across with a video screen behind this wall of sandstone. Arches was our first introduction to national park crowds and to give us an understanding of what Edward Abbey over 60 years ago was concerned and complaining about. This is Delicate Arch, one of the most iconic of all the arches. From the campground, a trail would take us through Broken Arch, to these delightful muffins on the far side, to this narrow slot, which brought us to Sand Dune Arch. Now let's take a short look at some of the views in the park. Amazingly, the Wolf family lived here and ranched here for 10 years around the turn of the 20th century. But the Native Americans were here long before that. Canyonlands has four separate sections. We camp for three nights in the needle section. This, in many ways, turned out to be our favorite part. It was fairly uncrowded. 
It is 34 miles to the highway and the road is paved, but it doesn't go anywhere else. We had some awesome hikes there. There was, there's a really stunning, there are really stunning views of the many canyons and we did have it pointed out to us that we were not in Michigan anymore. Our first evening there, we thought to hike over to the other loop of the campground. That's usually pretty straightforward in Michigan, not so much in Canyonlands. We did have the good sense to take our headlamps, the GPS, and have a turnaround time. When we got to the turnaround time, there was no sign of the other campground, just the trail going up another red wall. It turns out that there were two trails and we had taken the Big Spring Trail. Before leaving the park, we did find the correct trail and even that would have been a challenge for that first evening. Here, similar to arches, the geology is connected to sandstone cracking over salt domes. We stopped to visit Newspaper Rock on the road into the Needles Campground. The campground was a delight. There are large campsites that were well separated from the other campsites and it's a fairly small campground. In the picture that we're looking at, there's actually a campsite that is underneath the edge of the mushroom. What can go wrong? Midwesterners out of their world. It's getting close to evening and there's another loop in the campground. Let's go walk over to the other loop of the campground and then we'll follow the road back. Yes, well, there are two trails that diverged and one of them kept going, kept going. Fortunately, we had enough sense to set a turnaround time if we had not shown signs of getting to where we wanted to be by such and such a time, we'd turn around. Well, this is our view when we got to that time and we realized we should be heading back and it was really a good thing that we brought our headlamps and the GPS with us. And even if we'd taken the correct trail, we still should not have been out there at that time of day with our experience in the countryside because the correct trail takes you over the top of some of those mushrooms that we saw following cairns across the rock. You can look down below in the lower right hand corner of this picture and you can see a camper trailer. We're still well up in the air. Yeah, not a place to be for Midwesterners coming close to sunset. The trails were challenging and the views were absolutely incredible. Cave Spring Trail will lead you by the spring, past a recreation of a cowboy line camp that was actually in use, in use through the 1960s and it has several ladders to climb. And finally in Canyonlands, a full moon to send us on our way. After the remoteness of Canyonlands, Capitol Reef was a different experience. The campground is set in the orchards of the old Mormon settlement of Fruta on the Fremont River. 
grass, sprinklers, and deer wandering through the campground or a change from rock and pinyon pine. We were more adapted to the environment now and took on some more strenuous and spectacular hikes. Capitol Reef is part of the 100 mile long water pocket fold, a monocline unique in the Colorado Plateau uplift. This is on our way to Capitol Reef. This is Natural Bridges National Monument. And so it's a pull off the road and I think we probably spent a couple of hours there with um, some spectacular views of bridges and arches and um, I guess mostly bridges. There were, there were some historic um, cliff dwellings visible on these trails too. Great place to stop on the way. This cut into the rock we were calling an incised meander. Not sure that's correct, but something like that. And it, as we understand it, these happened um, and continue to happen during and, and after the uplift that caused these formations. There's a bridge here. Can you see it? Looking down on the Frutia campground in Capitol Reef that runs, the Fremont River runs through there. So there's irrigation that was done by the Mormons. So it was like a little green park, that campground. There are still orchards here, so lots of deer in the campground. They were around all day eating fruit from the orchards. Fruita Campground has a little general store and some historic sites from the Mormon settlement there. And uh, one of the things they had were these great cinnamon rolls and boy, did they taste good, especially in that open air in camp. This was a two hike and pull kind of trail. Um, this was a little more vigorous than we'd done too, so rigorous. So it was a good one. It was a great day, great day for hiking that day. We did figure out that if I carried my own water, I was much better at staying hydrated. That's a, I did it. I made it to the top um, celebration pose. These were curious volcanic looking rocks and we did learn later that they are indeed basalt and they were carried to this area on a glacier I think about 50 miles away is where they came from. Very interesting. This is Hickman Bridge. It had a nest of bees underneath it, or close by it. It seemed to react to people that would go through waving their arms in the air. Ruth decided that she was going to go through very calmly and it worked out just fine. I took the lower route and kind of went down below and came up in. It was excellent height. We really enjoyed the hike. This is part of the Grand Wash Trail. It goes a long ways and there's actually signs as you go along of um, more contemporary graffiti on the walls as well as some petroglyphs. They monitor this closely to um, keep people from defacing these cliffs. Some of it left from the Mormons. There's dates on things. It was pretty interesting. This was a little side trail off that Grand Wash Trail, went up into the rocks a bit, and these are called tanks, and I don't know how deep they are, at least 10 feet, maybe more, full of wildlife, insects, larvae, little brine shrimp, not brine shrimp, but little microscopic shrimp and things. Pretty amazing that there's these reservoirs of water up there on the cliff.
traveling from Capitol Reef to Bryce Canyon, we took some back roads. So we took the Notum Bullfrog Road first, and then took the Burr Trail, which went up with switchbacks over the water pocket fold. The climb up was quite interesting and quite enjoyed it. This was tops of Roos list for our western trip, and the scenery didn't disappoint. It is not really a canyon, but is an eroded escarpment of Pensugget Plateau. The park is at a higher elevation, seven to 9,000 feet, and it's into the Ponderosa Pine Zone. Like Arches, Bryce is popular with tour buses and so can be peopley at the main viewpoints and trails. The shuttle buses were a great resource for travel in the main section of the park. We did much of our hiking along the rim, but we did descend the Navajo Trail down and back up through Wall Street. This is a great way to start a morning in camp, coffee on the rim. Thor's hammer. A lot of these upcoming slides we took along a trail on the rim, so we're able to uh, see some of these hoodoos, which roughly translated means spirit person or spirit people. This one is called Silent City. If I remember right, this one is called Fairy Castle. It looks like snow down there, doesn't it? But it's not. This is Navajo Loop Trail, um, our GPS track as we wandered down there. So it's down into the bottom from the top and back up. It was a beautiful trail and I'm so glad I did it. It was categorized as moderate. I was cautious about taking those moderate trails, but we did okay. I remember right, this was pretty much back to the top and look, he's still smiling and I was willing to stop and take a picture. These trees work hard to survive, but it's beautiful up there, isn't it? Zion is likely the most popular of Utah's five national parks. It has absolutely stunning scenery and most visitors, including us, are in the canyon bottom and on a few trails. The canyon is also still a work in progress. Several trails were closed due to rock falls. One large fall had closed the Weeping Rock Trail and bus stop only about six weeks earlier. We took on two of the bucket list hikes there. The Narrows, probably only a mile and a half or two of the four miles to the turnaround, and Angel's Landing. The Narrows was Ruth's hands down favorite hike of the trip.
This is just the beginnings of some long tunnels um, along the way. There were some windows in the tunnels where you could see out and around you some of the landscape, but this geology was pretty incredible coming in. This is still on the way in, so just a taste of the inc incredible rock formations at Zion. There's a reason it was on my bucket list. This is at the Lodge and Visitor Center at Zion, so once you come in through that beautiful scenery, you find lots of people. There were lots of tourists, lots of international people in the park, and uh, they managed this in uh, Bryce a little differently than some of the places we'd been before. So as you can see, lots of people. I think this is a trail up to Emerald Pools. I'm not real sure, but you're coming through an area you can see there's water coming from somewhere as you see the little ledges where um, where things are growing. You know there's some moisture there and just not quite so arid, a little, little wetter. We did a lot of looking up flowers when we got back to a lodge or camp, but I can't remember what these were, but they were on a rocky ledge with some some moisture dripping down the rocks again, so something, water for things to grow with. Just beautiful. It's amazing how just a different trail can look so remarkably different. So now we're back in uh, semi-arid desert again. This is Court of the Patriarchs, and the rocks are named after patriarchs of the Mormon faith as well as um, Judeo-Christian in general, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then there's another one, an angel, Moroni, Richard thinks, um, they're in there somewhere. So most of the um, trails you uh, get to by shuttle bus, which is a way of managing cars in the parks, and um, as much as it's crowded and commercial feeling. Um, it does um, a lot of benefit to keep cars pollution off out of the out of the park in general and keep parking um, lots to one spot. And, um, we appreciate that what's been done there. This is the Narrows um, and it was high on my bucket list and it did not disappoint. It was probably my most favorite hike of the whole trip. So you travel up the trail on uh, solid ground and then the trail ends and you continue down the trail in the water you can go um, a long ways further than we did my goal was to get waist deep in the water um, there were a lot of people there and it, it was kind of um, a lot of exertion uh, doable but um, you had to have your hiking sticks you had to have good shoes that didn't slip on rocks and um, and it was just, it was a beautiful 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 hike. Made it to waist deep, so this was about the point at which we turned around. You could go on further up, and there was a log book up there where you could chart that you were there. Some hikers come down the other way and do it in as an overnight. You have to register especially to do that so people know, park people know where guests are. We had turned around and we're heading back when we spotted these folks rappelling, or perhaps there's another word for it, down on the cliff face in that little waterfall. A lot of people stopped and watched them. They were being very careful. It was very impressive um, how they were managing that. There were two people, I believe, maybe three in that group. This slide shows what we were talking about, that there were just a lot of people in um, management of traffic. So this is the uh, spot where the shuttle buses come in. So lots of people, a lot of congestion. And once you got through this and you were on your bus and heading out to your trail, it was a little better. This was early in the morning, so people were getting an early start, probably a, few, a little more crowded than it would have been later in the day. But um, again, it's a way of managing impact on the the land and the uh, geology and um, just the environment in general so it's got to be that way the 
This is part of the trail, I believe, up to Angel's Landing. Richard and I took separate trips up that. I didn't want to go all the way to the top. It was a little too risky looking for me, but I went up to um, Scout's Overlook. He went on up to Angel's Landing. If you've heard stories of that, you know it's it's one of their most popular trails, but it's pretty, pretty narrow at the top, and um, it's a long hike, and it certainly stretched my... Um, limits on physical strength. I had to stop and rest quite a bit, but it was stunning and very rewarding to get up there. Incredible walk. The next few slides will probably show some more of that. This is that little icon that's made Ruth say, maybe I won't go all the way out to Angel's Landing. It gets a little narrow. Some of the places you only have a chain or rope to hang on to, and there's people going both ways. Richard did go all the way out to the to the end of this trail and uh, he says it was very much well worth that should have let Richard narrate this one this is all pretty much to the end of the Angels Landing Trail and then you turn around and come back that, through that same narrow um, skinny trail passing other people coming back but uh, what a view what a view This is the part of the trail called Wally's Wiggle. So it's tight switchbacks coming up a pretty steep cliff. And uh, anybody who's done it will not forget it. So pretty spectacular just coming up. You had to kind of say, okay, push Ruth. Go, go three more legs of these switchbacks and then rest. That's kind of how I got through it. We chose the North Rim for several reasons. Information suggested it was less crowded than the South Rim. It's at a higher elevation and typically cooler, and it's closer than the South Rim to Zion. We really enjoyed the campground, which is in the Ponderosa Pine Forest. The views from the rim sites were stunning, and we were fortunate to have clear air and low pollution. We did venture ways below the rim on the North Chaos Trail and had the pleasure of enjoying the mules as they passed by. campground was a delight. It was well wooded and the sites were fairly private. We appreciated having both the showers, the laundromat, and the camp store to hide out in as it was cool and windy while we were there. The views even from the trail by the campground were spectacular. From the campground, we hiked down to the lodge and visitor center and took in the views from there as well. Did I mention that it was cool and windy while we were there? To be honest, neither words nor even photographs truly convey the immensity and beauty of the canyon. It has to be seen to be appreciated.
far below, the Colorado River flows through Uncar Creek Rapids. From the distance, you can barely see the waves. There are still signs of early residents up on the plateau, as you can see from these hands. We also were able to see the remains of pit houses that have been excavated and then filled back in. Also remains of some of the early days of ranching in the area. On our final full day, we hiked a portion of North Kaob Trail along with several mule trains and their exhaust. Dice, which is spelled like Dicelli, is likely an Anglicization of a Spanish attempt at the Navajo word to say, T S E Y I. This was the first of our three cultural sites that we visited. This site is managed with the Navajo Nation, and 40 families farm within the canyon. Due to this, you need a local guide to visit most of the canyon floor. We visited the overlooks and took a four-hour truck tour with a guide. This was a great introduction to the early Puebloans in the southwest. The visitor center has a recreation of a traditional Hogan. And a traditional summer house. Canyon de Che is within the Navajo Nation and the National Mon Monument is managed by the Navajo Nation. Access to the floor of the canyon is controlled as it is still farmed and ranched by families that live there. Only guided trips by guides that are authorized by the Navajo Nation are allowed on the floor except for one trail that comes from the South Rim to the White House. If you look closely on the canyon floor, you can just see a, tra a traditional Hogan and summer house. For our full day in the area, we drove the north and south rims, going to the various pullouts that allowed us to go to overlooks to look down into the canyon and to see many of the ruins from the above. Also, in several areas, there were information about some of the tragic history of the canyon. To visit the canyon floor, we splurged and took the four-hour tour with the most excellent Navajo guide who had grown up in the canyon. And he did a wonderful job of telling stories about both growing up there and pointing out a number of the pictographs as well as the ruins that are in the canyon. There were four couples on the truck, three besides ourselves, and one of them really wanted us to have our tourist moment, so we did. Just a few of the many pictographs in the canyon. As you can see, these are probably Navajo and certainly post contact with the Spanish.
Evidence of occupation in the canyon goes back over 4,000 years. The majority of the larger structures that we see as ruins in the canyon were likely built by the Pueblo cultures and were part of what was an absolutely amazing building boom throughout the Four Corners area in the southwest from roughly 800 to 1300 AD. And we leave the visitor center with a classic New Mexico scene. Mesa Verde was also on my bucket list. The cliff dwellings that Mesa Verde is famous for are from the last 200 or so years of the culture that lived there. However, there are over 700 years of settlement history that have been found. There was a glitch in the reservation system when we were there, so we were not able to take one of the guided tours but there's so much else to discover that we did not miss out. One of the highlights is the Chapin Mesa Archaeological Museum. It was also interesting to dis discover how Mesa Verde is connected to our next stop, Chaco. Mesa Verde is back up into higher country with elevations from 7,000 to 8,500 feet. Amazingly, up near, at the highest parking lot, near 8,500 feet, we found this group of antique cars recreating a West Ryan trip from the 20s. Although Mesa Verde is known for its cliff dwellings, the habitation in the area goes back hundreds and hundreds of years before those were built. In fact, Iconic cliff dwellings were only used in the last several hundred years of habitation in the area. Before then, people lived up on the maze of top and went from pit houses to pueblos on the cliff surface. On top of the mesa, there are preserved kivas as well as round towers. The spiral petroglyph is one of the most frequent found. The Pueblo descendants say that spirals represent emergence and migration. At least one structure on the mesa top is built similar to the structures in Chaco Canyon. classic cliff dwellings in Mesa Verde were built from the late 12th century to the very end of the 13th century. After that time, the people seemed to have abandoned those dwellings and moved. Today, the Hopi of Northern Arizona and the people of Zuni, Laguna, Acoma, and the Pueblos along the Rio Grande trace their ancestry to the ancestral Pueblo people of this area.
While in Cortez, Colorado, we went looking for a yarn shop. Alas, we missed the Taos Wool Festival, but we did manage to visit Taos Yarn Shop on Tuesday, October 8th. Chaco is a park that you have to want to go there. The best road in, the northern route, has nine miles of washboard and four miles of wishing you were on the washboard before the pavement at the park boundary. The story here is amazing and reaches out to much of the southwest in Puebloan culture. The main period of construction and use runs about 400 years until the mid-13th century. Put Chaco on your list to visit when you're in the Southwest. Campsite at Chaco had a cliff dwelling within yards of our tent. Pretty um, fantastic. This is showing some of the detail of the construction at Chaco Canyon. You can see that there's been some modern repairs to this, but what we found fascinating here was these logs that are um, built in for separating levels. Um, there's been a lot of research done on those with dendrochronology, so they can tell basically when those trees were harvested and where they came from to some degree. So we know that they came from about um, 50 miles away and, um, and they know what kind of wood they were and how old they were when they were cut and where. As you can guess, this is a pottery shard. Uh, the rule is that you leave things as you find them. It's okay to pick them up and look at them. Just don't put them in your pocket. Put them right back where you found them. We put this slide in to show some of the timeline. Chaco in general was in use from CE 850 through the, eight, through the 1150, so about 300 years of use and then abandoned. They don't really know why, but we put the slide in to show that. This is a big wall at Pueblo Benito, one of the largest structures that you can see. Uh, we put this one in because this wall is reported to be aligned astronomically, um, which we believe and, and the research shows is part of the purpose of this whole community um, is for ceremonial rites. Uh, in regards to stars, moon, sun, things. This is a piece of the old road. They tell us that there are roads coming from all directions into Chaco Canyon. So um, communities of people from all around the area, long distances away, would come at certain times of the year. Over the next couple of slides, you can see differences in styles of construction which um, sometimes is the date that they were constructed and uh, they were able to determine different builders by just different styles of how the stones were laid and how they were shaped. Pretty, pretty interesting. There was evidence found in some of these structures also of aviary areas where they kept macaws for their feathers, there were shells, um, there was um, chocolate found in some uh, vessels. So that all indicates that people came from a long ways away to do what they were there to do. This is a great kiva, the great kiva, the biggest one on the site, used for ceremonial purposes or um, rituals. You'll see a couple more slides of these indicating um, different construction styles. Our attempt at a little artistic um, photography, but also shows you how things were aligned uh, and the detail that went into these. When you think that people were using just primitive tools to create these massive structures, it's pretty incredible. Just to show you a petroglyph, but also these slash marks in the rocks, they believe were used to sharpen tools or practice cutting with, with uh, tools. The next slide will also show the slash marks and holes, um, also that they would have been using stone tools on. They're not really sure why the holes. This is just a great example of reverse pictographs where the colors put on and then the pictographs are carved out as opposed to a petroglyph 
which is carved right into the rock. This is the Hida Butte, considered to be a very sacred spot because of how um, there are three slabs of rocks on this butte that align to let the sunlight through, um, I believe morning light, that create what they call a sun dagger. And that has to do with the equinoxes and the solstices that these events happen. This rock also has um, the site of a signal fire on the top that would have been used. Those signal fires would have been set around the area to let people know, pilgrims as it were, that the time was approaching for them to come to Chaco. Chaco was not necessarily a city, but it was an area that was used for ceremonial rites, we believe. Um, so it wasn't necessarily inhabited full time um, by most of the people that came there. From Chaco, it was time to start heading back to Michigan. We did stop in Taos for the obligatory yarn shopping and some absolutely wonderful fresh blue corn tamales that had just been made. From Kansas to home, we were sort of surfing on the front of a storm. Yep, thanks for traveling with us tonight and thanks for being a part of Quiet Adventures. We'll end with a quick glance at some of the tools we use for planning other than the National Park websites, and they are very useful. Most of these were purchased at Schuler Books in the Meridian Mall in Okavis. The set of five National Geographic maps were purchased from utah.com slash shop. Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire and Colin Fletcher's The Man Who Walked Through Time are worth a read, even if you aren't going to the Southwest. I also recommend Wallace Steiger's Beyond the 100th Meridian as a biography of John Wesley Powell and his warnings the Moon Books, Zion and Bryce, covers far more than those parks and has valuable information about trails, camping, lodging, etc. in southern Utah. Paper maps such as this atlas and these gazetteers are essential for traveling in the southwest as self-coverage is poor or non-existent over much of the area. Finally, the parks will have pamphlets and guides available, and these can be very useful.